All right, James here. Now, before I start, yes, I have got the CCTV on in the background, and no, it's not because I'm a weirdo and I like to spy on people. It's because I'm waiting for somebody to turn up, and with the CCTV on, I can see when they turn up. To be honest with you, when I'm working out here, I often have the cameras on the display because then I can see when deliveries turn up and stuff like that, and it's actually quite handy. Now, you might see random security lights just flicking on and off. It's uh, Don't worry, it's not ghosts, okay? I've got cats and they just wander around the garden and set the lights off so don't worry it's not gonna be like one of those episodes of one of them shitty fake bloody ghost hunting programs you see on discovery channel because they just make me sick they are so rubbish utter garbage every episode it's the same it's like they've got some cheap nasty bloody radio shack multimeter and they're like touching the probes going oh look at the readings oh look we've got so much paranormal activity going on in the room right now look boop 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 and it's like shut up and get a life you dickhead And in this repair video, we're gonna be looking at this edging trimmer. And this particular one is a Virotex FR156N, and this is the 750 watt model. Now, this came from a local joinery firm, and the guy said basically one of his employees was using it, and all of a sudden, bang, nothing. Just went completely dead. So that's what we're gonna look at today. Now, to save a bit of time, I've already checked the obvious stuff. So I've checked the fuse, that's fine. I've checked the continuity on the wire, the cable's fine. So essentially, it's gonna be something inside the actual machine itself. Now, these machines, uh, like most sort of trimmers and routers and cutters, are actually quite simple machines. There's no real gearbox or anything in there, so to speak. It's essentially, it's just a high-speed universal motor. You've got a high-speed bearing assembly, uh, a collet where the cutter goes in the end, and then the, the brush assembly at the back. And essentially, that's about it. So if it's just an electric motor, there's not really a lot that can go wrong with it. You know, it could be a burned out winding, brushes, could be a little thermal fuse that's triggered. Other than that, it's not really much else. However, this one has a little speed controller on it. So that adds another variable to the repair because there's gonna be a little control module in there with a, a little triac which controls the speed to the motor. So it could be a problem with that. They're usually quite simple boards. If they've got feedback though, they can be a little bit more complicated if they've got uh, speed feedback from the motor. Um, but essentially it's just a triac and sometimes what can happen is there's on the triac you've got a pin called the gate and there's another little component in there called a diac which is a little diode two-way diode and sometimes that burns out and then the gate of the triac doesn't get triggered you get nothing so that could be the problem now the thing is um, with these sort of control boards in here sometimes it's an absolute nightmare because they are actually potted so the circuit board is put into a little plastic tray and they fill it with potting resin. So they usually pot it with the most nastiest kind of epoxy resin that you can't get off so that you have to buy a whole new unit. So let's hope it's not that because it's going to be a very boring repair video. Otherwise, it's just going to be basically no troubleshooting. Yeah, there's a problem with that. I'm going to have to get, get hold of them and order one. So we'll see if we can repair it. Anyway, let's take the cover off. And we'll see, because I'm actually assuming already that it's the electronics. I don't know yet. It could be the switch, it could be the brushes, who knows. So let's get a close-up. I'll get this thing apart, and we'll see what's actually inside it. Okay, so we'll get the cover off this thing. Now, before I take the cover off, I'm just going to take this platform off, because um, that will make it a little bit easier to work with if that's not on. And I'm going to start methodically. I'm going to start, obviously, where the cable comes into the uh, tool and then I'll work along to the motor. So to get this cover off here, there's three screws in there. They are Torx, and they look like, I would say, Torx 20. And I promise you I haven't tried this beforehand. I'm just gonna guess. I'm actually gonna take uh, the part out now, 20. So, it's, yeah, that's a good guess, Torx 20. All right, so let's take these out. And I've actually got one of these uh, magnetic trays now, so I can keep my uh, screws nice and safe in there. Let's try and, okay, that comes off. I reckon that back probably comes off as well, which it does, brilliant. Okay, so, so we've got the mains cable coming in here. We've got, that's the trigger there, which is actually just a little momentary push button that gets pushed in when you push that up. 
Then on this side, you've got, this is the control board. Oh, boo. They have, they've actually potted it all in. Okay, well, it's not a complete disaster. It's actually not that badly potted. It's actually just more of a conformal coating. So I might still be able to do something with that yet, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it because we don't even know it's that yet. So we'll, uh, we'll do something with that if we have to. So anyway, the, the mains cables go into the switch this side and they come out this side and it looks like it's actually a double pole switch because there's two lots of wires for each side and they come onto this board here which is going to be the speed controller and they come out of the board they go into here uh, this looks like it goes into one side of the field winding then it comes out and goes into the brush one of the brushes then around this side we've got another field winding connection here and then it comes out and connects into the brush okay so that looks fairly straightforward and there's also two more thin wires here which go down from the main control board onto this other little circuit board at the top of the uh, com bars here on the armature and that's going to be the feedback which i was talking about earlier so there's a little hall effect sensor on there and as the motor spins it causes a tiny little fluctuating magnetic field on that hall effect sensor and it uses that uh, to detect the speed of the motor and control the speed so that's pretty much all um, so pretty much uh, we're going to start from the input and we'll work our way through and we'll see if from the uh, input side to the switch to the output we've got continuity when the triggers pushed and if we have then we'll then check to make sure the windings are okay, make sure the brushes are okay, make sure there's no thermal fuse in here that's activated. And uh, if all of that is all good, then we'll start to troubleshoot this board. That's what I really hope we don't have to do because that is just gonna be a real pain in the ass. But anyway, okay, so I've got my multimeter here and I'm just gonna turn the continuity buzzer on. So when we connect our test leads together, we get a beep. Now I've put a crocodile clip on the common lead because I can see this is probably going to be very awkward otherwise with two probes. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to test from this side of the button to the other side and see if we've got continuity through the switch. Now there's actually four wires on this side. Now two of these thinner green wires go onto the control board and they come out of the control board and then thus power the motor. And we've also got these slightly thicker black wires which come off of here and they go underneath the control module and in there there's going to be a large capacitor and that is used for power factor correction now it doesn't really matter which one of these we connect to on the back here they're both going to be connected together so i will just get the uh, crocodile clip and just clip onto one of those and i'll put the probe onto this side and when i push the trigger we should get a beep which we do so that side's fine and just to test my theory that they are both connected together i'll ch check the other connection as well and we do get a beep so i'll check the other side that was the neutral so we'll just check the line now and see if we've got anything on that side yeah okay so we've got continuity it doesn't necessarily mean we've got power because you know we can have continuity but it doesn't mean we've actually got vast current flowing through here so we're not going to rule out the switch immediately but at the moment the switch is working as it should so that's fine so we'll go past that now okay so we know that power is getting from the power cord to the switch we know it's getting through the switch to the control board um, but we don't know if the control board's working, but we'll, we'll delve into that in a minute. First thing I want to do is actually just check the motor first so we can rule that out and see if that the, uh, the thermal cutout in here hasn't operated. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to unplug the field winding on this side and I'll unplug the one on the other side. And what I'll do is I'll just test the resistance across the motor. Now this is a 750 watt motor, so give or take, I'm expecting about sort of, you know, seven and a half, eight ohms. Uh, that will vary, obviously, because of commutation from the brushes. But OK, so we've got 8.3 ohms. And if I spin it, it should sort of vary because it's obviously the commutation from the brushes. So that's fine if I rotate it and go through uh, different windings on the armature we can see they're all pretty even so that's fine so I can pretty much say that the thermal cutout in that motor hasn't operated and that there is continuity across the windings of that motor 
Oh dear, so it looks like it is going to be the uh, the electronics here. Boo. So I'm going to have to try and get this out and uh, have a closer look and see if we can actually do anything with this because this is all potted. Well, it's not potted, it's got a conformal coating over it. So anyway, let's, uh, let's have a look and see what we can find. Okay, so before I take the control board out, I'm going to remove the uh, two screws on the cord grip because I suspect that they may go right the way through um, because they look very long and I suspect they go in there and hold that control board in place. So I'll take those out and I think we'll just take the power cord off actually. Okay, so that's off. If we need to do any testing, I've got the isolated supply, I can just put the crocodile clips onto there. Um, so that's fine. So now that that's loose, I'm going to get a spudger and see if I can get that unclipped and get this moved out the way. Okay, that's come out. Let's just try the other side. Okay, bingo, that's out. Right, there's that capacitor that I was talking about. So that's all very well and good. So this is the module then. Right, okay, so is that actually gonna come out of there? Okay, now there's actually a little um, tension spring clip on there that holds that dial on there and that is right in my way. So I'm gonna see if I can get this little spring clip out with a pick and uh, hopefully we can. Do, 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 that'll do. And then uh, I can get this dial off and that'll give me a bit more room to work. Okay, that's off. That's hopefully magnetic. It is, good. So then we'll try and push that out. And it's gonna be one of those little side-mounted through-hole uh, trimmer pots on the board, I su suspect. Uh, yes, it is. So it's just a side-mounted trimmer pot. Right, okay, I'm gonna have a fiddle around with this and see if I can get this board out and uh, we'll see what we can do. Okay, so the board's out. They actually just used a little bit of epoxy to hold that in, so that's fine because when we come to put the board back in, I can just use a bit of epoxy to put it back in, so that's fine. So that's the little plastic cap. So there's actually no conformal coating on the back side where all of the large solder joints are for the serviceable components like the triac and the uh, capacitors and the other bits. So that's a good start. At least we know we've got some um, ability to desolder if we need to. Right, so I'll tell you what I'm actually going to do first is I'm going to disconnect all the connections on here and get this circuit board out of the tool so it's a bit easier to work on. And that's that one. And there is obviously that other um, connection. And they have actually just used a two pin header connector on that. So we can actually just disconnect it. So that's good. So if we ever did have to replace that part, at least we know that that's a, a, an easy thing to do. Okay, so first thing I'll do is actually just take this heat sink off so I can see a little bit more on the board. Now, one thing that I've seen that I really do not like is this screw. Now, you'd think there would be a little nut on the back of that screw, but no. They've actually just used a self-tapper and they've just mashed it straight through the fiberglass circuit board there. They haven't even put a nut on the back of it. They've just literally chewed it through the board. That is very, very cheap and nasty. I do not like that at all. So yeah, not good. Okay, that's fine. The screw can go in there and heat sink off. And they haven't used any heat sink compound on the back of that, but to be honest with you, triax are quite thermally stable. So, you know, as long as they've got some form of heat sink, that's actually okay. So we take a closer look at this board. We can see here's the triac. And I can just about see that this is an ST part, and I can just about see a BTA on there. So this is a BTA series uh, triac. For this particular application, I would expect that they're probably using a BTA 16600B. Uh, so basically, one of them. So that's good, at least we know we've got one in stock. So that's fine, so I can replace that if needs be. Now the other components that are on here, we've got a couple of small ICs here and I've also noticed this header here. Um, so this is possibly a programming header. So we're looking at this possibly being a microcontroller, uh, which I hope not because that means that that is gonna be nigh on impossible to replace um, because I can't program this because I don't have the software that goes on that chip. 
So if it is that controller that's gone, then well, we're gonna to have to get a whole new board. So let's hope it's not that. Right, so what I'm gonna do is get the acetone, see if I can wipe off some of this conformal coating, and uh, we'll see if we can see some of these part numbers. Okay, so I've got some acetone here. Let's see if we can uh, get some of this off. Right, okay, that's looking like that's gonna come off, good. Yep, that's looking good so far. Okay, so I've managed to get pretty much all of the conformal coating off of this board, so we're back to a clean circuit board again. Now, there is still some residue left behind from that, so what I'm gonna do is just plop this into the ultrasonic cleaner for 10 minutes and just get all of that off and get it nice and clean and uh, to a condition where we can start to work on it. Okay, so we've got our board in there. We'll just pop that into the ultrasonic cleaner and we'll pop that on for about 10 minutes. Okay, so we'll just pop that out. There you go. That is now nice and clean. So we can now go and work on it. Okay, so I've got a magnifying lens on here now, so we can take a closer look at this board and see what some of these components are. So if we look at the main switching component, you can see my guess was actually correct. It is in fact a BTA 16600B, which is a 16 amp 600 volt triac. And the part over here, which we thought may have been a microcontroller, surprise, surprise, an Atmel AT Tiny 45. So that is just an 8-bit microcontroller. And it would make sense why they've used this part because it's actually a very, very low power device. And uh, in an application like this, you want a low power device, which means that these pins on the top of the board here are obviously an ISP header or an in-system programming header. And that's to program that microcontroller. So that's good. And over here, this part here, which says uh, 9928, which if it is the max 9928F, is a current sensing amplifier and it would make sense because we've got this big current shunt down the middle of the board here and it actually connects to that so that looks like that is the max 9928 current sensing amplifier and the rest of this is basically just supporting circuitry and that big capacitor in the middle is an electrolytic cap and that's probably just smoothing for the uh, components and i've noticed they've used all low power chips on here so the power supply for these obviously derives from just kind of like a resistor or some kind of um, capacitive dropper but we'll uh, we'll have a look at that and see how that actually works so the first thing I want to do is I want to get a multimeter and I just want to check the very basics so I'm going to check these uh, ICs to make sure they have actually got power and if they have got power make sure they're outputting what they should be outputting okay so I've got this board connected to my isolated power supply now so I'm just going to power this board up with a limited supply and I'm just going to measure across those ICs and see if they're actually receiving any power so let's just power this up now whoa okay I don't know if you just saw that let me just um, zoom you in there and show you that right so I've turned the overhead light off so you can see this a little bit better but when I power this up you watch those two big resistors in the middle there yeah, that's sparkling like a Christmas tree. So those two resistors are completely knackered. And I reckon those two resistors are what are actually supplying power to those ICs. That's probably where the power derives from. And they're quite big ones. They look like maybe 2550s. So yeah, they look like they actually need replacing. They actually don't look very well at all, do they really? Right, okay, that's good. So that gives us some direction now. We know what we're looking at. So I'm gonna replace those two resistors. And if I actually look close up on the resistors, I can just about see that the code on one of those is 551, which would make these 550 ohm resistors. And they are both in parallel, which means that would make the total resistance to be 275 ohms. So, at least we managed to sort of salvage the value off there. Now that value does sort of make sense. Um, there could be a Zener diode somewhere on the output of those resistors that's clamping the output to whatever voltage it needs to be to power those ICs. Um, and then there could be some sort of voltage regulator. There are some small um, little transistor packages down there. Possibly one of those is actually a regulator. So we'll see what that's all about. But first of all, I need to get these resistors changed. So I'm gonna have a look in my parts bin and see if I've got some of those. 
Okay, so rather annoyingly, I've got absolutely no 2550 resistors at all. Most of the stuff that I deal with is either 0603 or 0402, and that's mostly what I've got in there. And I've also got this other tray, which is just, um, you know, odds and ends. These are end of reel components. So what's whatever's left on the reel of components just gets trimmed off and left in here. And I've got absolutely nothing in there either, which is really annoying. So obviously this is gonna be a special order. Now the thing is, I don't wanna order these parts in specially if I order them in and it actually doesn't fix the board and there's actually more to replace on here. So what I have got plenty of is uh, through hole metal film resistors. <laughs> so uh, I've got those in that value. So what I'm actually gonna do is I'm just gonna bend the leads over on one of these or two of these and just solder them directly to the uh, to the pads there and actually test it and see if it works. And if I can get it to work with these, then obviously the board will work and I'll order them in specially. But for now, I'll just put two of these on and see what happens basically. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and remove these resistors from the board. Obviously they've got to come off anyway because they're, they're dud. So um, what I'm actually gonna do is just take this electrolytic cap off of here because uh, I don't want to go melt in this when I use hot air to remove those uh, those resistors. Now, unfortunately, in removing the conformal coating, I've actually taken all the markings off this capacitor, so I have no idea uh, which one is the negative lead. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to look underneath, and I can see that this lead here is connected to the ground plane. So I'm actually just going to put a mark on that side of the capacitor, and just in case I get really confused, I'm going to put a mark on the side here of the uh, little potentiometer so I know which way to line that capacitor up. So I'm just going to go ahead and remove that now. All right, so I'm going to use the old favourite, the old desoldering pump, and see if I can remove this capacitor. It might not come out very easily because that ground plane is quite hefty and it's going to sink a lot of heat away from the end of this soldering iron. So I'll see what I can do. Uh, that's all right, that worked pretty well. Yeah, okay, let's go to the next one. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so that's the capacitor removed. I've still got the little black dot on there, so I know which way to put that back in. And now I can get to the resistors a little bit easier. I've got a bit easier access now. I'm actually gonna use hot air to remove these resistors. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put down a, a heat proof mat so I don't burn a hole in my desk. And also I'm gonna protect the surrounding components with a little bit of Kapton tape, just mainly the sensitive ones that are made of plastic like the capacitors and this potentiometer and definitely that connector because the plastic that they're made out of is less heat resistant than butter. It will just basically melt in seconds if I uh, apply hot air to that. So I definitely wanna protect those. Right, so I've got the capped on tape on now, protecting all of the parts that I don't want to melt. So I've isolated these two resistors. So I'm just gonna firstly apply a little bit of flux to these before I go ahead and uh, try and hot air these off. I've got the hot air station set to about 320 degrees and I've got it on a sort of medium airflow. I've already taken the time to sort of preheat the board a little bit before I do this. So I'm just gonna go ahead and heat up those resistors and uh, see if I can uh, just remove them from the board. There we go, that's one. And that's two. That's it, that's those removed. I'll give you a close up look at one of these resistors and you can actually see they're in a really poor state. It actually looks like they flashed over to be honest, so it could be a possibility they could have got a bit of moisture or dust in there and that conformal coating has not really done its job and it looks like it's flashed over, so yeah. Either way they are not good, so definitely needed to be removed. Okay, well, I'm just gonna clean those pads up, but before I do, I'm just gonna put a little bit of fresh solder on those pads just to help me wick the solder off. This is gonna be a bit awkward to get into. So I'm just gonna use the desoldering braid just to wick that solder off. And that should leave behind a nice clean pad. So that's all the old solder and gunk removed from those pads. So what I'm gonna now do is I'm gonna prepare the resistors and then I'll put a fresh bit of 
solder on those pads and then I'll solder the resistors down to the pad. Right, so what I've done is I've bent the resistor leads down and I've bent them around in a circle to create kind of like a little platform that can sit on the pad and then I can apply solder to that to hold it down to the pad. So I'm just going to do that to the other one and make two of those and we can solder them on and hopefully that will be, uh, that will be all good. So basically put the tweezers on there and then I can bend the resistor lead over and then I can basically get the tweezers and then fold it around in a circle and just trim that off like electronic origami. Okay, so what I do is I'll dip the resistor leads in a bit of flux and then I'll hold that down and try and solder that down onto the board. Okay, that's one. Let's do the other side. And that's two. Okay, that's well and truly on there. Brilliant. So I'll do the other one. This is resistor number two. That's done. And that side. That's done. And that is definitely well and truly on there. Brilliant. So I'll give you a close up so you can see what I've done. There you go, there's a close up so you can see what I've done. And you can see they are very well bonded to the board and that should be just fine. And before I go any further, obviously I've got to put this cap back on. So I'm just going to use some desoldering braid and clean up these pads a little bit before I put that back in. Obviously I'll be cleaning all this flux residue off before I'm finished with this board. These have actually got through hole plating, so I might have to do this from both sides, I reckon. Okay, so that's the pads all cleaned up, so I'll just put that capacitor back in, and I can go ahead and solder that in now. Make sure it's in the right way around. We put our little black dot on there so we know. And I'll go ahead and solder that in. Okay, that's good. Okay, so I'm actually at a point now where I'm ready to power this board up and test it. Now the problem is, if I power the board up in this condition, because it's not receiving any feedback from the motor, what it's gonna do is initially it will turn on and it will start to switch, and then as soon as it realizes there's no feedback, it will think that the motor's actually stalled up and it will just cut out. Now, I'll be honest with you, if I even see it do that, I'll be quite happy that the circuitry is receiving power because that's doing exactly as it should do. Then I'll be confident enough to put this board onto the motor and do a full power test. But I'm not gonna count my chickens just yet because about half an hour ago, this thing was doing absolutely diddly squat. So if I can get it to do anything at all, I'll be happy. So I'm gonna power this thing up. I'll get the oscilloscope and I'll show you the output on this and we'll see if it actually does what it should do which is start switching and then cut out okay so i've got the oscilloscope connected to the motor connections and i've got some power coming in here so as soon as i switch that power on we'll see what we get on the display and fingers crossed we should see it switching okay brilliant there's the switch in and there's it cutting out because it's realizing the the motor's not spinning brilliant so that's doing what it should do Okay, so I've actually decreased the time base slightly and I've set a trigger on here so we can actually see one cycle of the AC waveform in a little bit more detail. So I'll switch that on now and you'll see what it's doing. So you can see there it is and then it cuts out. Now that may not mean a lot to you, it means a lot to me because it means the board's actually switching and doing as it should. So I'm just going to very briefly explain to you actually how this works and I'll just draw a very brief quick diagram just so you get a better understanding of what's actually going on here because I appreciate that that probably just looks like a funny line on a screen. So I'll just do a bit of explaining. Right, whiteboard time. So I'm just going to very briefly explain to you how this switching principle actually works. Now, at the heart of all of this is a device called a triac. Okay, now you heard me mention that earlier. So we have a triac and the symbol for a triac is this. Now there is a couple of interchangeable symbols for a triac, but this is kind of like the most recognized one. Okay, so on here you've got three terminals and again, these are interchangeable, but the one that's the most common is terminal A1. 
you've got A2, and you've got gate. Okay, now sometimes these are actually referred to as MT1 and MT2, or main terminal one, main terminal two, sometimes just literally one and two. They're, they're interchangeable, but the most common one that you'll see on most data sheets is A1 and A2. This is the triac. Now I'm gonna draw a very simple circuit just to kind of explain how this works. So over here you have your voltage supply. So this is an AC supply. And we'll basically, we'll just say that this is 230 volts. So we'll say it's the mains. Okay, so 230 volts, obviously AC. And we'll take off of this a terminal and we'll call that live, okay? Obviously it's AC, so it could be live or neutral, but we'll just say that that is live. And we'll run that through some sort of load, okay? So we'll just say that the load is uh, a light bulb, okay? So let's say we've got a powerful light bulb that light bulb then runs to terminal A1. Okay, so the, the, the power is now flowing from the source through the lamp into A1, and then out of A2, it goes back and returns on the neutral or the return, which again could be live depending on which part of the cycle the AC waveform is in. And essentially there you've got a completed circuit and that runs around like that. Now, the thing is, in this condition, if this was now live, absolutely nothing would happen, okay? You'd get a slight amount of leakage current through here, but essentially this bulb would not be lit. And the reason why is because there is nothing triggering this gate, okay? So if we was to take a feed from A1, and we was to put a small resistor on here to limit the current, and we was to apply a small amount of current to this gate terminal, magically, the bulb would light. So essentially, what a triac does, it is just an electronic switch. It switches a large current by you applying a small current to the gate. Okay, so essentially it is just that. It's just a switch that's controlled by a very tiny current, and these the gates on these things are very, very sensitive. They only require a tiny amount of current to actually switch these things on. And essentially, that's about it. Now, you may be thinking that that's a little bit pointless when you could just use something like a relay or a contactor like this, because that's the same thing, right? You're essentially just using a low current to switch a high current. And yeah, you're right, but there are some applications where this is used. For example, something like this. Now, this is a solid state relay, and it's used in industrial machinery. And essentially, it's the same thing as a relay. You've got two uh, terminals on there which are low current terminals and you supply that with low current DC and then on the other side you've got two more terminals which can supply up to 25 amps or it can actually switch 25 amps AC okay so essentially it's the same thing it's just got no contacts it's just that inside there now you're probably thinking well what's the point in that when you could just use a regular relay well, the thing is, there are some instances where you wouldn't really want to use a relay or a contactor. One example is if you're in an industrial environment where you have an explosive atmosphere due to gases or dust in the air. And the problem is when those switch contacts open and close, they're going to cause small arcs inside there which could ignite explosive atmospheres. So <clears throat> in a situation like that, you'd want to use something like this because there's no contacts in there, it's solid state, there's no chance of this thing arcing and exploding something if you're in an explosive environment. And the other thing is, if you're switching something that needs to be turned on and off rapidly, like some sort of solenoid, and it needs to be turned on like literally 50 to 60 times a minute, this is probably not going to be the best option because these relays are only rated to a certain amount of switching operations. And once it gets past that, it wears off the material on the contacts which um, prohibit arcing. And eventually those contacts will just arc and burn out and your relay fails. So this, essentially there's no moving parts, there's no contacts. Potentially this could switch on and off as many times as you like and effectively it could last forever. Obviously it won't, but you know, it lasts a hell of a lot longer than that if you're switching it on and off rather rapidly. So there are applications where this is actually quite useful. Now, instead of supplying this gate pin with a constant current, if we actually vary the current going to this gate pin, depending on the threshold of the gate to trigger this on and off, we can actually control quite accurately whereabouts in the cycle this uh, triac actually triggers. 
So let me give you an example. So if I just draw out the waveform of what one cycle in your main supply would look like, it would actually look like this, okay? So this is just a sine wave and from this point here to this point here is one cycle. So in one cycle, the waveform goes from zero volts all the way up to 230 volts, then back down to zero, then it goes down to negative 230 volts, then back to zero. Okay, so that is 360 degrees of a cycle. There are 50 cycles in your main supply, hence 50 hertz. So this would happen 50 times per second. So this is constantly fluctuating and this is that hum that you hear from the mains, the 50 cycle hum. Now, when you trigger the gate of the triac, so when you supply it with enough current to make it actually switch on and start conducting, essentially what will happen is once it reaches a threshold voltage, it will actually turn on and it will stay on until it gets to the zero crossing point. So as soon as it goes positive 230 volts and goes back to zero, this here is called the zero crossing point. And as soon as it hits that zero crossing point, it stops conducting unless it's re-triggered. So if the current is still on the gate, as soon as it reaches that threshold voltage again, it will trigger again until it gets back to the zero crossing point. Now, if you was to not trigger the gate here, let's say you was to trigger it, say, here instead, well then what would happen is your triac wouldn't actually conduct until it got to that point. So you would have like zero volts, absolutely nothing, then suddenly it would come on at that point. And what it would then do, as soon as it reached the zero crossing point, it would shut off, so you would have nothing here, and it wouldn't re-trigger again until it got to this point. So you would have like nothing, nothing, then suddenly it would trigger. Okay, I've actually drawn the waveform a bit lopsided here, so it, it, it doesn't really show the effect very much. But essentially you can see it's kind of chopping the waveform. Okay, Okay. so here's a quick example. So we've got an AC supply, a triac, and a motor. So let's just say when this motor is supplied at full power, 230 volts, it spins at, say, 2,000 RPM, all right? Now, let's say we only wanted that motor to spin at 1,000 RPM, so we only want to supply it with half the amount of power. Now, the way we would do that is we would trigger the uh, triac to conduct halfway through the cycle. So essentially, instead of having a full sine wave, what you would have is you would have nothing at all, then it would suddenly start to conduct in the middle of the waveform, then it would get to the zero crossing point, it would shut off, and it would then be re-triggered further on in the waveform, so it would be nothing, nothing, then it would suddenly trigger and then go back like that. So instead of getting the entire, I'll just draw in what the waveform would have been. Okay, so this is the bit of the waveform that's missing. So we're just chopping that out and we're only getting 50% of our waveform that we was getting before. So we're actually only supplying half the amount of average power going to that motor. So that is how we actually control the speed to the motor and we can actually modulate this. So let's say we want it to spin at only, I don't know, 500 RPM. Well, we would chop more of the waveform away. So this is the waveform here where it would be and we're actually conducting at this point Okay, so we're, all we're doing is we're changing at which point the motor actually comes on and off. We're, we're actually just chopping the waveform away. And this can actually be modulated to control the average power going to your load. So yeah, believe it or not, that's a brief explanation. Okay, so I've got all this board connected back up now and ready to do a full power test. So I'm gonna hold that in case it decides to vibrate off the desk, because uh, hopefully, Fingers crossed, I'm hoping this is actually gonna work now. So I'm gonna apply the power now. <sighs> Believe it or not, that is music to my ears because uh, that's a good sign. So it looks like it's working now. So actually that's a good thing because that now means I can get the oscilloscope and I can actually show you exactly what I was trying to explain on the whiteboard earlier. And I can actually show you a graph of that and you can see in real time what's actually happening as I control the speed of the motor. 
Okay, so I've got the scope hooked up to the two motor terminals now, so hopefully you'll see the switching waveform on the display. Now, once this tool's fired up, you're not going to hear me at all, so hopefully the trace on the scope will kind of be self-explanatory. But basically, as I turn this dial, you will see that the, um, the phase angle will be modulated to essentially control the power going to the motor. So I'm going to fire it up now, and you'll see exactly what I mean. We have nothing on the display, why? Oh, <laughs> there you go. Make sure you've got the hold off. So if I now turn this up, So there you go. Now connecting that scope up was actually for my benefit as well as yours because at least now I can see that it's working exactly as it should. So pretty much I'm quite happy to um, say that just replacing those two resistors will pretty much fix this board. So now all I've got to do is go ahead and order in two of those resistors. So I'm going to have a look on a few sites and phone up a few electronic suppliers and see if I can get uh, a couple of those resistors. I'll probably have to end up buying a pack of 10 or whatever. So. Anyway, whatever, I have to do it, so I'll order two of those in. I cannot believe it. I've just tried DigiKey, RS, Maplin. None of them seem to stock resistors in that size, in that value. I've just tried two of my local suppliers, and they both just said exactly the same thing. Yeah, no problem, we can get any value in that size. What are you after? Uh, 550 ohm? Yeah, no problem, we can order them in. Great, how long is that going to take? three weeks no three weeks is too long i cannot be holding on to it this guy needs this thing back so i cannot be waiting three weeks so plan b i'm going to use through hole resistors <laughs> but i'm going to obviously do a better job than i've done there i'm going to do it more permanently i'm going to make sure i do it neatly i'm going to insulate the leads so that they don't short out on anything inside there and i'm actually going to go replacing the conformal coating on there anyway so to be honest with you functionally it's going to make no difference this guy is not going to see any difference in the performance of the tool so by that token i might as well just do it and then at least i can get this thing fixed and get it back in his hands so that's exactly what i'm going to do so i've already got the parts here so i can get cracking now Okay, so what I'm actually gonna do here is, first of all, I'm gonna remove these two resistors because they were just kind of lashed on there temporarily. The soldering joint isn't particularly great, but that was just a temporary job. They can actually come off. Then I've got two resistors here, which I'm gonna replace them with. And what I've gone and done is I've actually cut some little pieces of heat shrink tubing, and I'm gonna put one of those on each leg, on each side of the resistor, shrink that down. I'm gonna bend it over and put the little platform on the bottom. And then that heat shrink tubing will basically stop the resistor leg from shorting out on anything inside here. Then once they're on, I'm going to get a little blob of two-part epoxy resin and I'm going to resin those resistors down to the board and I'm going to stick them in place so that they can't move. Then I'm going to conformal coat the board front and back and call it done. And that will be absolutely fine and that will suit the purpose. So that's what I'm going to do. So I better get on with it. Okay, that's one. Do, 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 do. Oh, I shouldn't hum actually. That's that's probably breach of copyright on YouTube, isn't it? Okay, so I'm going to hold that in the pliers because my fingers aren't made of asbestos. And I use the hot air gun, just shrink those down. That's one. And that's two. Okay, that's number two. That's probably quite hot. No, nope, that's fine. Brilliant. There you go. That's that done. Shut up. Thank you. Right, so I'm going to just bend the platform onto the bottom of these resistors. And I've just realised I'm actually doing this in completely the wrong order because I just told you I was going to remove those resistors first, then do this. And I'm actually doing this first, so not necessarily in that order. Right, that's them done. 
Okay, so next thing I'm gonna do is just remove those two resistors, and I'm not gonna to lie to you this time, I actually am gonna remove them. That's one off. And that's the other one off. Brilliant, so I'm just gonna tidy those pads up a little bit. Yeah, there's some kind of strange gunk on my tip, I need to get that off. I'm sure there was a dick joke in there somewhere, but I wasn't really gonna to rise to it. Well, I'm just gonna tin the tips of these resistor leads now. I'm just gonna use my little clamp freehand holdy thing, which is looking very beat up and tired, but it is very well used, to be fair. And I'm actually using 0.5 millimeter solder for this, the really thin stuff. I actually prefer it for doing stuff like this. So I need a little bit of flux on there. One, and that's two. All right, I'm gonna try and do this without removing that cap like I did last time. I've got a little bit more room this time because I've left these resistor legs a little bit longer. Okay, all done. Okay, so I'm just gonna clean all this gunk off of here with a brush. And the usual formula for this, equal parts of piss coloured liquid to clear coloured liquid. Mix it up thoroughly. Then we apply the resin. Like so. And then we use UV to cure the resin. About 15 seconds is long enough. Rock hard, job done. All right, that conformal coating stuff is pretty toxic and stinky stuff. So I'm gonna come out in the workshop and do it. Oh, it's fucking freezing out here. Oh, all right. Oh yeah, I forgot it's a shithole in here. Uh, hmm. Well, the bench is kind of out of the question, so I make my own bench. that side and that's that side let that dry and believe it or not that's all you need all right put that heat sink back on although I'm still not too happy about that screw situation with the screw just kind of going straight through the board like that but oh well I'm just putting the board back into the plastic housing I've just noticed they've actually just kind of lopped the corner of that board off because you can see there's a bit of a scabby edge on there where the ground plane's been cut into. So presumably that side used to go down at an angle like this side and they've probably put that in there and thought, oh, hang on, we've got no way to hold the board in. So they've just got a Dremel and kind of lopped the corner off and gone, yeah, I'll blob a bit of hot snot in there, that'll do. I don't know, it's just a bit weird why they've just taken, they've literally just cut the whole corner off. It's a bit odd, but there you go. Right, that's in, and I'm not just gonna blob some hot snot in there, I'm actually gonna use proper epoxy. Kind of spread that a little bit. Now, this epoxy claims that it sets in 90 seconds, but in, if, in actual fact, it takes about two to three minutes, so I'll just leave that to set. Right, okay, that's all set up, so I'm gonna put this dial back on. Now, I need to make sure I put it on the right way round Otherwise, the little notches in the bottom won't line up and you won't be able to actually turn it. So that should go in like that. Yeah, that's it. So I've got full range of motion on that pot. Brilliant, so that's it. Okay, so I'll put the little spring clip on the bottom. And I can actually just use a pair of tweezers to push that down. Like that. Okay, that's good, that's not coming off. Brilliant, so that's ready to go back into the tool. That's in. Okay, that wasn't too bad actually. Okay, so we've got to get these um, switch connections back on now. 
I might have to use the old uh, long nose pliers for this. Let's get those back on there. This one. And that's two. So motor connections are easy enough. And they've got these nice little plastic clips which uh, clip your wires in and hold them all in place so they don't get crushed in the housing when you put it together. It's quite nice. Tension to detail there. Well, I'm going to put the power cord back on now and I'm going to restrip these ends so they've got some fresh connections in there. Right, that's it. So I'll just tuck these wires into their little channels. Tighten that cord grip down. All right, we're on the home stretch now. Cover's going back on. Power switch works. Brilliant. And put the little platform back on. Like that. There we go. Right, let's go and give it a quick test. So yeah, I think we can safely say that's now working. So I'm very happy about that. That's another successful repair. So there you go, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, if you've got any comments or constructive criticism, bung it in the comments section below. And if you like my videos, then feel free to subscribe. The button's down there somewhere, just click the button and whenever I upload a new video, you'll be made aware of it automatically. Technology, it's amazing, isn't it? So there you go, thank you for watching, nice one.